Well, we might get started, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Paul King. I've uh, been involved in the Groovy community for a long period of time, and uh, for my sins, I've been involved in many, many application areas, and part of that overlaps with data science. So this is a bit of talk that spans uh, Groovy, and it also spans a little bit of data science. We could spend the whole talk uh, defining data science terms. I'm not planning to do that. We could do the whole talk explaining what Groovy is. I'm not planning to do that. So it's going to just be a, a little bit of a, a mixture, giving you a glimpse of a few things, and um, we'll have a look at using Groovy with Grail VM towards the end as well. So um, it's basically four parts. Very quick intro to Groovy. Most of you here have probably seen it. I don't know. Well, show of hands, who's seen Groovy and who's got no idea what? OK, those who didn't put your hand up, who's seen Java? Who's, or, or have you seen Python? Anyone? OK, so there's a mixture of audiences here, but we'll, I'll do a quick quick intro of, of Groovy. Um, and it's on auto move to the next slide, unless I bump something. But um, then uh, quickly look at what classification is. So that's, that's one of the things you might want to do in a, in a machine learning scenario, one of the algorithms, one of the processes. Um, then we'll look at a particular problem, which is a, it's a well-known uh, data science set that if you were learning machine learning, in, in a, if you went to a course or, or learned about it at a university, they'd probably roll out the IRIS data set. It's, it's a very well-known uh, established example. And we'll look at that just using a fairly, fa fairly standard algorithms for doing classification. I'll, I'll show you, talk about some different algorithms. And then we'll look at using neural networks. So what's Groovy? It's a language. It's fairly widely used, but s much smaller used compared to Java, for instance. So it's probably 1% of uh, the penetration that Java's got. But still, it's, you know, while we give this talk, there'll be um, 20, probably 4 million downloads while, we, while we're giving this talk. Um, so um, you can go and have a look at more details about Java. We're very keen for more people to, to come and contribute, so come along to the project, and uh, we're we'll, happy to chat to you. So what's Groovy's value add? What's the, if I'm giving you the, um, I'm in the lift with you, and I've got 20 seconds to, to tell you, I'd probably pick out these, the, the, the uh, five, six bullet points that are there if, if I was uh, trying to explain. So simpler scripting. Show you a couple of uh, examples of that. Extension methods, there's a lot of uh, functionality that we've put in that really enhances the functionality that you get as a developer compared to a out of the box uh, Java experience. The flexible typing, so some people uh, love static typing, some like dynamic typing. We just give you the whole range and you can pick whichever you like. So if you want uh, duck typing, we'll give it to you. If you want stronger than Java typing, we'll give you that as well. There's a few things in Groovy that we've improved over the years for OO programming and functional programming. I won't have time to talk about any of that today, but come and see me around the, around the corridors for the remainder of the conference, if, and I can ha happily chat to you. There's another powerful thing called AST transforms. may have thrown in one slide on that. I can't remember if I put it in this deck or the, the later deck. And also, if you're, trying to, if, you're, if, if you're seeing all these new features coming out on JDK 21, 22, 23, or whatever you see, Oh, I wish, wish we had those, but we're stuck on Java 8 or Java 11 or whatever. Groovy will probably give you all of those features in, on early JDKs if you want. So this is a really oversimplification of, of um, some parts of, of, of uh, the, the Groovy value add. But if uh, you pull out JDK 23, which will be released in a, you know, towards the end of the year, and you, and you enable the, the preview mode, you'll be able to write a short script sort of like this. All right, it's got no class method. If I'm on an earlier JDK, I'll have to whack a class around that as well, and I'll have to have a slightly longer declaration of my main method. Uh, Groovy would just give you a shorter version of all that, and it'll give you that from JDK. Well, from one point, it'll give you this sort of thing. And both will give you the same result. The, it'll be using Java Lang strings, Java util array lists and things, the exact same classes that you'd be using in the Java world, you'll be using in the Groovy world. If you sort of tap, uh, jump into the testing space, this is testing that same example. So we, we had a, a list of um, uh, some strings there, birds, cats, and dogs might be your pets, and we were checking which of, which of those is, is of size three. So the cat and the dog are size three, the birds of size four. So we expect the cat and dog to come out. We'll write a test that's going to count how many. And for the, for the list of strings, there's cat and dog is going to come out, so the size is going to be two at the end. And we've got a list of lists. 
and the size of that is only there's a list of two long and a list of three long and a list of one long. So only one of those is of size three. So we're expecting one to come out. So that's the Java code. Um, we can cut and paste the same thing, and that's the Groovy code as well if you want. Or you can, like we saw before, you can write the, um, the smaller version as well if you want, and you can have it as a script or a class, whatever you like. And if you get into the Groovy world, you might want to check out a, a thing called Spock Framework. It's got some uh, nice features, and you could write this if you wanted to in a data-driven format. And it would be nice, very easy to sort of start adding more things into that, and, and it uh, makes your test very clear, and you get really good feedback when this goes wrong on all the th different things that might go wrong. And sort of tying this back to the sort of data science world, let's do a bit of matrix manipulation. That's the kind of thing you might want to do in, in um, data science. Hopefully these days you're at higher levels up, but this, you might have to dive down to this level at some time. This is using Apache Commons Math. Yeah, we're using Apache projects, and we're just going to multiply. We're going to multiply a matrix by itself, so that's the power of two, and then we're going to multiply it by another matrix. So fairly simple thing. Um, that's how you do it in, in Java, and if you want to in Groovy, it can be look like that. And it's the same Apache Commons math gets called, the same method calls get called, but you can see it's a lot simpler for what you've got to type, and when you go back to read this and have to maintain it, it's a lot simpler. And you can the Groovy console that I'm running this in is extensible, so I can have a, a LaTeX-generated matrix as my output if I want, or whatever you like. You can have any anything there that um, in the Java world you can produce. It can be, can be the uh, result of any script that you run. And I mentioned that one of the, the second bullet point I mentioned earlier in terms of if I was giving you the elevator pitch for Groovy is that it's got a whole bunch of extra extension methods. So it's got a whole bunch of methods for ha working with primitive arrays and things like this. So here I've just got a very simple thing, an array of uh, uh, primitive integers there. And if I want to find the, the maximum value in that, and also the maximum absolute value. So if I had a negative 30 in, or negative 40 in that list, negative 40 would come out as the maximum absolute. So I'm ignoring the sign. Um, th this is the code I would use. So these days I'd use streams in the, in the Java world to do that. There's no functionality on uh, arrays for give, give, giving you this thing, but streams have all of this functionality built in. And that's what I would go and do. I can do the same exact same thing in, in, in Java, but because of, we've kind of added a bunch of stuff, we've got full support for doing a lot of these same operations that, you, that Java gives you for, for streams all on the uh, integer arrays. And that's when you're doing data science, that can be uh, re really, really nice. And um, you can get a lot better performance out of that. So, so the, the, uh, the, the, Maroni, uh, the purpley sort of color is, is Java. You can see the Groovy code's not, it's sometimes faster, sometimes slower than Java these days. And if you start using the, the, the stuff that we've got, it saves you the overhead of doing streams, there's less boxing, less stuff happening, you can gain a lot of speed. And yeah, I did, did throw in one uh, slide about AST transforms. Not as relevant in data science unless you're creating a lot of your own domain objects, but it can be really handy. Here's six lines of Groovy code, there's the, or 10 lines of Groovy code, here's 600, the 600 lines equivalent Java code. Now, if you've used Lombok or something like that in, in the Java world, you can sort of do this similar sort of thing. It's built into the Groovy compiler, and it's all extensible. You can easily add your own ones of these. And long story short, Groovy can make things really short. It can encapsulate design patterns easily, and then you don't have to worry about, did I create an error when I was writing the Java code for that design pattern? And uh, it saves you a lot of time. And it's the intent of what you're trying to achieve in your classes greatly improves in my in my view there too as well. So what's uh, classification? Classification is just putting things in classes. So um, if I've got uh, wines, I've got red wines and white wines. And if someone brings in a new wine, we'll all look at it and look at the colour. And unless it's a pink colour, we might be a bit confused, but normally we'd know, oh, yep, that's a red wine, that's a white wine. So classification is all about just putting things in different classes. That's all it is. And so if, 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 if a series of, of, of uh, data points here, I want to split them into different classes. And the old, uh, what I'll do is create a model. So what, um, some, some sort of human will tell you whether it's a red wine or a white wine initially, but you might only have metrics on the acidity of the wine or the, the whatever it might be, and you're going to try to guess, the, guess the, uh, th the classification based on other data. And what the idea is, you create a model based on you've got a whole lot of data points about a, um, 
data set. You know what the classes of everything is. You create a model that, that somehow maps from the data points that you've got to the class. And then when a new data point comes along, you use your model to predict which class that's going to be in. So what does this get used for? Image and speech recognition, spam filtering. So when I'm looking at a spam message, if they're trying to sell me a bridge, I know there's probably spam or whatever, so it goes and calculates this sort of information. When a new message comes in, it goes and looks at its model, looks at all the things that are in that, that mail message and decides whether to put into the uh, spam side of the equation. Um, so customer behavior prediction, fraud detection, medical diagnosis, when they're trying to spot shadows in x-rays and things, this sort of thing comes into play. Let's look at the, the IRIS model. So it's a, it's a fairly standard data set. So th there are pictures of um, iris flowers over there. Turns out iris flowers, it looks like they've got six petals, but actually three of those are leaves, which are called sepals, and three are petals. So in or, you know, as part of evolution, if they had six, pe six things that looked like petals, they attracted more bees and whatever, and so ones that had big sepals and things like that, um, compared to flowers that had green Look, so some plants have uh, the sepals look like leaves, and some they look like the flower. And certainly in, in irises, they, they look like the flower. Um, but um, they're a distinct thing, and we're going to take measurements of those. And this, it turns out there's three classes of uh, iris flower, um, and we're going to try to, when we take one, we'll, we'll do the measurements on it, and we'll be able to see uh, which of those classes it might be. Okay, um, just so you know, I take my research seriously. That's the one I grew at home, just to make sure that it's all worked. Um, if you want to know more details about this, we're just going to glimpse at a few small examples of, of this particular problem. Um, if you want to know more, there's a blog post on, on the Apache site that looks at all the you know, eight different algorithms, six, six or seven different uh, libraries. There's no... Um, Apache library that does classification. There is uh, open NLP does has a Bayes classifier built into it, but it's not designed for. Uh, we've got a sort of Gaussian distribution issue with this one with lengths of things. It's designed for documents, so it'll do the spam filtering, but it won't do this particular problem. So none of, none of the classification libraries that we're using um, currently support it. We I might go and contribute some of those to Commons Math at some time, but anyway, that's, enough, that's not for today. Um, so. Different visualization libraries, different things, different whatevers, all are in the, talked about in the, in the blog and in the repo. So there's lots of examples you can go and look at that in your own time. But basically, it's just a set of, we've got a set of data points with uh, some classifications, and we're going to spit that into this algorithm, and it's going to start predicting stuff. And um, we're going to get things like a confusion matrix, which just tells us how, how well our model is compared to the real data. And we're going to be able to visualize stuff. And we'll, we'll look at, I won't go into to those things, but that's sort of standard uh, data science stuff. Um, we're going to use a weaker library in one example that I'm going to show you. It's actually got a whole lot of stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a weaker tool associated with that weaker library that has the weaker library sort of bundle in it. You can use the library by itself or with the tool. And if you go and grab this tool, you can sort of load the CSV data set and you can, start, you can go and run the different algorithms. It, it detects what, thing, what algorithms are inside its own library and it lets you select one of those and, and run it. Um, here we're just going to use it to visualize. This is petal width and you can see the, I forget which, which uh, of the, if it's Satosa is the blue, I can't remember, but one of the classes, all of the petal lengths are, are very small. Other ones are quite widely spread, and so on. You can see for sepal width, sepal length, sep um, petal width, petal length. Um, you can go visualize all that. If in that tool, you can run all these things, and it goes and tells you, here's what your um, decision tree looks like. Here's the classification that I get, and it shows you graphs of the decision points for the decision tree, and it gives you confusion matrices and things, um, which I haven't explained yet. We might as well do that now. So this is... Um, there's 150 points in the data set, and in this particular case, with the model that it's using a decision tree model, there's different algorithms that you can use for this classification. Um, it got four of them wrong for Versicolor, and it got five of them wrong for Virginica, which are two of, two of the classes. So we could decide, is that good enough for us? Um, different models take longer to train, 
So you feed training data through them, and then you use them when new data comes along for testing purposes. In most of the examples here, we're using the same data for training and testing, which that's a no-no from the sort of data science point of view in terms of it. Um, I'm not really getting good accuracy for whether my model's any good. You normally want to have a separate data set. In some of the examples, I've split out the data sets, but when I'm giving you pretty graphs, I normally just use the whole data set because then you can sort of visualize what, what's sort of happening there. Um, so don't really want need to spend a whole lot of time looking at the um, the code for this. This is some, some groovy code that's going to call the Wicker library and it's going to use the na naive Bayes classification algorithm and I'm just going to show you what that looks like. Um, is this any different? If, if I go and uh, look at the, the Javadoc pages from, from Weka, it'll show me Java examples and they'll probably just be twice as long but it's not it's only a small simplification that Groove is going to give you, but it's, it's a nice one to have, and there's certain kinds of operations in the data science world that just work really, really nicely if, you, if you've got a really good library for, for uh, doing sort of map filter reduce style things, which uh, Groovy's got that built in. We've got a little bit more code that's going to draw some pretty graphs for us, and then when we run it, uh, we get this. So we've got four for, for Versicolor and two wrong for Virginica. Otherwise, everything's right. So you can see the purple, the four purple squares are the wrong ones for Versicolor here, and the two little red triangles are the ones that are wrong for uh, Virginica. And it's not unexpected because they're the ones in the, the sort of overlap area, right? So that's it's not um, unexpected that that's the that's where the contention and the errors might might occur. So this data set's known to have that contention point. So it's a good one for seeing how well different algorithms can d distinguish data that's, um, that's closely related like that. I can change just one line and go get the, sim uh, the simple logistic classifier and it does, it only gets one incorrect in those two. So it, it's, it's a different algorithm that it creates a, a, a sigmoid thing. It's basically takes all your data as inputs and tries to create a, a function to get to your output and then does a linear regression on that function and uh, tries to maximize how well look good the model is and it does it does better might take a bit longer to train the model but so these are the trade-offs that you would typically look at one of the other algorithms is a decision tree algorithm so this is an algorithm that tries to um, split the data into pure data sets so if I was trying to um, uh, work out who are the people in the room that might have a, a gray beard um, I might ask a question like, are you older than 30 or under, than, under 30? And if, if by answering that, that question, it split the group exactly into two um, and everybody in one group was of one class and everyone in, in the other group was of another class, that would be a uh, really good thing to have in my decision tree algorithm and I would go and um, get that. Anyway, it does reasonably well. It only gets three incorrect. Uh, there's another um, algorithm ca called KNN. Um, I'm, I've got another talk that's going to talk about k-means, which is very closely related but but different. This is from a library called Smile, and the way this this works is, if I'm using KNN and K happen to be three, I would go and find the three closest points, and then if I'm doing a regre this algorithm can be used for regression or classification. Uh, if I was using regression, I'd average those out. If I'm doing classification. I'd go and see if ha, the majority class. So if there's two greens and a red, I'd pick green. If there's three greens like there is here, I'd pick green and I'd just classify that as green. So that's what, how that algorithm works. And it does a pretty good job. The, um, this is just switched over to another visualization library. There's ones that render all this stuff in 3D on a, on, in a uh, browser. The other ones would sort of, uh, there's ones that using Java effects and uh, this, uh, previous ones were just using an X chart thing. Right, so um, let's just quickly have a look at now using a neural network to, to uh, solve these problems. So what's a neural network? Basically, it's, it's um, a, a, a set of nodes here that uh, got stuff coming in, some sort of decision gets made about them, and it to, to, to the next thing. And it's modeled after the human brain. And so, so each, each of the nodes looks sort of like this. There's inputs coming in and there's a weight. So if I'm like trying to uh, walk from here to the doorway, 
there's all a whole pile of information. I might be feeling wind coming in from here. I'm seeing different colours for the chair and the carpet. I'm seeing light intensities from different things. And, you know, your brain would be overwhelmed if all that information was needed in order to make a decision, do I, do I go left foot or right foot? So it goes and puts sort of weights on these things and it dampens things down at certain times and it makes other things important. So if I see a bright light as I'm walking across the road at night, I know I need to f put the weights on those up and focus and turn around, is the car coming or whatever? Um, so that's how your neural network will work. We're going to apply the same thing. And on the inputs here, we have all the different things that we're measuring and we've got the different classes on the other side and we'll have different layers. And we can have as many layers as we like and the layers can be measuring anything. And often in the, in the, um, the big um, um, neur neural networks, in the deep learning networks, they don't even... You know, we associate... I was trying to give you a human association with... The, the car and the bright lights. Okay, I see a bright light, you know, see changes in, in visual, visual information, and I turn to see a car before it runs me over. For all the big machine learning networks, it's not a human visual thing that's happening in these nodes. It's just a bunch of numbers coming in, something gets detected, and a bunch of stuff going out, and it's been trained to f pick a certain thing. And we don't have a human association with a lot of these things here. And where does the term deep learning come in? Well, if, it, if you just had one layer or just the two, two outer layers, that's just a neural network. But as soon as you have multiple layers, it's deep. Okay, nothing magical about that. So you're all now deep learning, um, deep machine learning experts. Let's have a look at the, um, the code now. This, there's, the uh, website's got three different uh, libraries you can go use. This one's weaker deep learning. Again, the, the code for this will only be yeah, 20% smaller or 50% smaller than the, the Java code. So um, otherwise, it's the same as using the Java code. And I've got to run it. Um, and this is the result it gets. I haven't got all of the metrics on the timing on this. But um, you can see here, I purposely ran this for, um, I, I didn't train it for a very, very large amount of uh, iterations. And you can see it got quite a few of them wrong. And I can go and decide I want to train for longer. So um, most of the other algorithms that I showed you, they've got a fixed training time. For a neural network, you can do further and further and further iterations or add more and more layers and do more and more work and make these things better. And I purposely did it to not be too good, but I could go and uh, change a few of the metrics here and get a, a much, much better one. Um, there's three libraries that are shown in the, in the, the blog post. That was uh, Deep Learning for J there. Um, the other one I'm going to look at is Deep Nets. And here I will go split my data up so we can, get, we can measure a few things. Again, the details of this aren't important, but most of these libraries have a way to build up your neural network of diff the different layers and set the different parameters that the neural network is going to need. And then you just run them and they just go and do their stuff. And here is the thing here. It, it took about three seconds of real time, 10 user, and half a second of uh, system time. And it uh, got the answer there. Um, what we're going to do now is take this, the script I had, compile it with minus, minus compile static, which gives me static, static compilation. So what's the, what's the significance of that? Uh, Groovy's got some dynamic features and some static features. If I was using dynamic features in that script, some parts would no longer work, and this wouldn't compile. And the compiler would tell me, this is a dynamic feature. You can't do that here. Um, turns out this, there's no dynamic features in this script. So um, um, it's the same sort of code that I have in Java or, or Scala or Kotlin. Um, so it just compiles it up happily. Then I, I run it through a, a few steps for, for GraalVM. I configure a few things. When you're using GraalVM, it's... Um, You've got to often tell the compiler a little bit of extra information. So there happens to be a random number generator inside deep nets. If I don't tell GraalVM that I've got a random number generator there, when it goes and optimizes my code to make it small and tiny, it'll give me the same random number every time. It might not be what I want. Other things like a system property. Do I want the system property when I run my exe, or do I want a system property at the time I did my compilation and did all the analysis? So I've got to tell it a few things. And I can then run it, and now it's um, sort of 
t a few milliseconds, the dot exe or the the the, uh, bo the binary in, in the um, if you're on Mac OS or Linux, the, the binary is very very small and it runs super super quick. But it's doing the exact same thing. So um, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>